Oh, we're live. It's Saturday morning, and I was going to do a nice little dope introduction for the show today, but I, I don't really have one, and I got the pod crew waiting, so we're just going to get started with, hey, 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 it's the big baby, and I'm back with my friends. Let's introduce everybody. What's up, Wayne? What up, dog? Travis, how we doing? <laughs> What's going on, man? Candace, good e- uh, morning. A uh, good afternoon, morning. <laughs> and to our, our, our special guest today, how you doing, Miss Miss KP? Hey, Miss Rudy Wellness. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to have you all here today. We got a nice little list of topics. We're gonna try to keep this to no longer than three hours and one bathroom break for me, cause uh, people got stuff to do today. But before we start, I think Candace has a special announcement to make. We're going to put it on the front end of this. <laughs> what? Don't you got a podcast or something? Oh, I, th- I thought the special announcement you were referring to was the apology topic. I was no, like, we're not going to open that. Uh, I do, yes. Um, so I have a podcast. Uh, we talked before on here about the season salt, um, which was a collaboration with me and a ministry partner. Um, the season salt has transitioned into black and call. Um, easy to find on Instagram, just black and call. Um, and it also has a podcast component. We do um, a lot to inspire um, creatives, entrepreneurs, and really everybody, not just in those like kind of pockets of inspiration, um, but people who are called to anything. Some people are called to teaching. Some people are called to be parents, um, but trying to inspire black people in what they're called to, especially millennials. So black and called. Black and called. Hey, man. <laughs> Black and you are called all of y'all are black and called and it's true. Everyone here, everyone here is black and called. <laughs> Especially you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard that I was black a lot in my life. <laughs> I knew he was gonna go there. I was man. talking about the oh, man, man, man. black part, but okay. All right, so I've been coming up with this list of words or phrases that I'm just really tired of hearing, right? And I just think we need to cancel them, you know, along with cancel culture. And I think it started with the conversation I was having with Travez a couple months ago, just about how when people just be saying certain shit, it don't matter what it is that they're talking about. I no longer want to listen because they've lost me. So like the first phrase is protecting my energy. Like, oh, I'm doing this right here to protect my energy. Don't get me wrong. It is important to protect your energy. But God damn it, every time something is is, is off, it, it ain't always about your energy. You know what? Sometimes I'm going to have a bad day. And it, I think it's just an overused phrase that takes away the value of situations that actually require someone protecting their energy. Oh, don't respond at once. Y'all ain't gonna touch it. Y'all scared? I mean, what's going on? I was waiting on you to hit your words, man. What words? What? Give me some more specifics so we can. Uh... Okay. The next yeah. one is manifesting. You always manifesting something. How about you work hard and go do it? Ooh. I know what I deserve. Do you really? Do you really know what it is that you deserve? You may feel like you deserve something or you want something, but you don't. You don't always know. You might value yourself much highly than what you really are. Or maybe you don't value yourself enough because you just aren't self-aware. Keep the same energy. No. I'm going to feel how I feel when I feel like feeling. Don't tell me how to feel. Period. Or it's close cousin. Period. Poo. Nothing else left. Uh, Yes. Yeah, Yeah. Okay. It's yes. Stop it. Use your English. Talking about retrograde, all that star worship, that's idol worship. I, I, I don't need to hear none of that nonsense. People ain't ready for that conversation. No, yes, they are. Like, there's a lot of people having these conversations. You're just not listening to them. Get your head out of the sand. Manish. 
No, that's 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 for Candace. I provide the things. We should keep that word around. <laughs> and the word female has been brought to my attention in recent history that um using referring to a woman as a female and just leaving it as female is disrespectful. Can we leave okay. that female for another conversation? Like after yeah. this topic? Yeah. Because I, I, I it's gonna work by itself. Yeah, yeah, that's gonna carry itself. So let me play hardball with you, Adam. Let's go ahead and start pod, man. As far as people that aren't ready for that conversation, some people aren't, man. And you have to know who you engage in and who you speak into in order to make sure that you are relaying information to the right audience. Because in certain scenarios, people have to be in a certain space and a certain mind frame to hear certain things in order for it to be an effective and efficient form of communication. I think it's valuable to look at somebody and say, no, you're not ready to have this conversation. Go sit down, check in with yourself, get your life together, come back, let's revisit. But I don't know. I can't, I'm i going to hold on to that one, whether you, whether you despise it or not. That's that's the right answer, Wayne. But I think more so what Adam is talking to about all these uh, social media activists who are not really trying to have that conversation themselves, but want to point out that somebody else is not ready for the conversation. Mm, okay. <clears throat> yes, yes. I was not talking about in a in a one-on-one situation where I'm talking about, you know, this widespread Oh, they but they ain't ready to talk about that though. Right, right. Yes, yes, we are. You talking about the un the uninformed, uneducated who like to just drop that and walk away to prevent them from demonstrating any form of depth? That community? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, the super woke community, you know, barely made it through high school, but all of a sudden they got all the answers because you know we wasn't. We, I was learning the right stuff while y'all was learning what was in them school books. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I think when people say. Oh, but you're not ready for that conversation. Sometimes I want to flip it and say, no, you're not ready because you haven't researched it yet. You don't know what you're talking about. That's why you're saying that. Because you can't tell me what I'm ready for. You have no idea. You're scared that when you say what you're thinking that you know, that I'm going to come back with something because I actually know what I'm talking about. That deflection. And, and along those lines, because I don't have a conversation with you don't mean I ain't ready for it. Maybe it's not worth my time to having that conversation with you. Cause like you said, you're not ready for it. <laughs> okay. So what do you, how do you propose they uh, fill in that gap, Adam? They, they want to make something known. But they don't want to embarrass themselves on their platform. How do you propose they fill that gap in, man? Um, so I learned something a long time ago. Uh oh. It was when you're presenting, when you're doing a presentation, if you don't know what something is, don't use it in your presentation. If you're going to use an acronym, make sure you know what the acronym means, because sometimes you may have to shorten the acronym for the space of your PowerPoint, right, and use it instead of presenting a full word just for the optics. And I was always taught, don't bring up information that you can't direct, that you can't intelligently speak about. So if I don't know about something, I'm not going to act as if I know about it. That's that's my um, advice to them. Okay. But what do I know? So I have a perspective to offer to this that's a little different than the way we've been going. Because the place where I usually see they're not ready for that conversation these days is Black people referencing white people and issues of injustice um, in the Black community. There's a lot of, I, I don't see as much, y'all not ready for that conversation um, well, I see it in black people referencing white people and social justice, and I see it in men referencing women in conversations about women's behaviors. Men often saying to women, y'all not ready for that conversation. So I think it's interesting, the male agreement to the perspective that's being offered by um, Wayne Chu and also Kariki, um, but specifically because you two guys brought that perspective as well that sometimes the people who are saying they're not ready for the conversation really are the ones that ain't ready that's interesting when considering men frequently saying that to women in social media space these memes that are like y'all <laughs> y'all women um say one thing and do another, but y'all not ready for that conversation. I, I don't know. It's pretty recurring. So what do you, like, how do you deal 
with that? What do you say to your own male community in that regard? And then when it comes to black people, um, do you still think, like do all of you still think that people, black people are saying to white people, y'all not ready for that conversation because we're not ready to have it? Because I actually do think that there's some preparedness available for black people to get into, to have conversations about social justice that a lot of us haven't touched yet. Okay, let me preface my, my antics with this, all right? I usually generalize when I'm trying to start a pot. So when I throw that y'all phrase out there, I'm poking. I'm trying to start a pot up. So in scenarios where it's in reference to the other gender, that's me stirring the pot up and I'm all for it. I, I, I love that part of it because I like to spark that conversation knowing that that's usually what it's going to turn into. In reference to the racism history portion of it, I think that's a little different. Um, th there's so much history that hasn't been taught that I would likely agree that a lot of things that we aren't ready for. When we look at the way that the traditional education system is laid out in this nation, there's so much anti-African-American history conversation that occurs in the classrooms that there's a lot that doesn't get discussed. Even from the use of the language of slave to those that are enslaved, the language, the words, the implement, the implement of those in the textbooks, they drive every conversation which is where I go back to things like that 1619 project and how that should be put into the schools to allow everyone to be ready to have that conversation. But when it comes to the racism part, I don't think everyone's ready because there's so much that's happened, not just in this nation, but in order for this nation to be built that we missed and haven't heard about yet, that I, I don't think we are ready to actually have an intelligent conversation but we can have a conversation where things get shared, information comes about, and then hopefully we go back and do our research. But for that portion of it, yeah, I don't think a lot of people are actually ready from an informed perspective. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And then also, with uh, just to, to answer your question, Candace, I don't, and kind of like what Wayne said, if, I'm, if I use that y'all phrase, I don't do it on a public platform anyway, because I'm not, I don't care about everybody's response. So I'm gonna use it to, with people that I'm trying to have a conversation with. So yeah, in our group chat, you know, we'll, we'll bring up something like that all the time, stirring the pot, but we're having a conversation about it. Um, but I'm not gonna, I don't care to, to I don't speak generally like that anyway, unless I'm really trying to have that conversation. Um, and I think dudes who say that um, the suckers anyways, so I'm usually making fun of them. If I'm putting, putting that in any type of group, chat, discussion thing, because it's like, bruh, people that have whatever conversation you have with them. I'm someone who likes to talk. If you want to have a particular conversation with a person, you can have that conversation as long as you present it in a way that makes that person open enough to receive and what it is that you're saying. But yeah, to that race conversation, uh, yeah, a lot of people aren't ready to have that race conversation because you don't know what the backlash is going to be because we, we're often comfortable living in a place of ignorance of we don't talk religion, we don't talk politics. Why? Because we may find out somebody that we have to be around, somebody that we thought that we like somebody that we thought that we love thinks differently of us th or our people than what's presented to us. So we try to live in this place of blissful ignorance of I've known you forever or you're my boss or you're my coworker. And I don't want to really know how you feel about these hot button issues because you may not feel the right way towards them or the way that makes me now feel comfortable being around you even though your feelings may not actually affect what we do with each other day to day. And you're just afraid to, you're afraid of that unknown. So yeah, people are on the same side saying, Hey, you're not ready to have that conversation. You may, you may be right. They're not, but you're not ready to have it either. Can we invoke a name drop in this one real quick? If, 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 if you're dropping the name, you can drop whatever name you want. And I appreciate it. So we go back to uh, not too long ago in our recent American history where the artist known as Kanye went public with the statement slavery was a choice, right? Mm -hmm. Dude caught all sorts of hell. The challenge that I have with his conversation is the lack of detail he gave, 
But there were some people that chose instead of to be enslaved, they chose to walk off of ships. They chose to walk into water and end their own lives instead of finding themselves to be in a position where they are enslaved. When it's presented that way, his statement has some value. It has some logic to it because there were people that absolutely chose to not live versus being enslaved. But when we have conversations like this, we have to really be willing to dig in and push to have the, that conversation public to allow people to be in a position where they can do some research to dig in and understand the history of where they're coming from. And then they will hear about the water walkers of that era that made that life choice or that choice to not live under those um, conditions. But that conversation requires a feeling of, of vulnerability, right? And in the society that we live in, with, with with being people afraid of being canceled, which cancel culture is, is fake for the most part. Um, if you're good, it, it, it you're good. So people are afraid of that because you may show your vulnerabilities or your ignorance, and that in turn becomes with you being intolerant of something that you're actually ignorant to. I feel you on that. And if anybody tunes into the Black and Call con- uh, podcast, they'll have a little conversation with you about the value of not living in a cancel culture concept. So food for thought, some information out there about that. Kariki, you quiet. What I was going to say, you know, on the flip side is there are some of us who are not us Black people who are not, um, we don't have, how can I say this? Not that you need to be calm, but we don't know how to have an intelligent conversation when it comes to race relations in this country because our feelings are involved. And sometimes people can't hear you. They can't hear anything that you're saying because of how you present it. Um, I know for me personally, a portion of my life, I didn't grow up in this country. So there's a lot of things that I don't know and I'd have to read about it in order to have an intelligent conversation with a white person about my feelings about how we're treated in this country. And then there's a portion of black people who feel like I shouldn't have anything to say because I'm first generation American. So, you know, that's a whole thing too. (laughs) They feel like I shouldn't say, and I'm fair skinned. So I just really should shut up. So there is a list of things when it comes to y'all not ready for that conversation. Well, I don't, maybe I'm not ready for it either, you know, or people who are like me aren't ready for it. I don't want to, I don't, I'm not the ambassador for that talk because of being first gen and being fair skinned, according to a lot of black people in America. So I ain't ready. So they ain't ready. (laughs) It's a lot of stupid black people in America. So, you know, they, you can you can feel however you feel, and I think that our backgrounds, our diff, our different backgrounds, can put us in different places to have certain conversations. But if you do your homework, if you do your homework, I think that anyone can add value to any conversation. It's like the idea of, oh, well, you didn't play this game. How can you write about it? How can you coach it? You can still have an understanding of what's happening and a different perspective, even from the perspective of the person who lives that life, which may amplify some things that people who are actually in that in that struggle, who come from that different background can uh, understand. Yeah, I agree with that 100 percent. And, you know, just because someone may be first generation uh, black in America, who am I to tell you that your your experience isn't value in or you, you know, you don't have enough experience to talk about this or to, to be on this platform, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> that and the idea of the issues that we deal with in this nation aren't exclusive to this nation. They are absolutely the common denominator and the issues that are being addressed are highly in reference to our melanin levels, period. So for those of us that, regardless of whether we grew up in the UK, whether we grew up in the US, whether we came up on the islands, it, it's always a melanin related issue. However, we want to divide it. We want to break it down. We want to put it into various sects in order to make it more of a 
you can't speak on this because you don't know my struggles conversation, where in reality, the issue isn't about where you're from. It's 100% about what you look like, but go for it. Feel free to make it a, a where you're from conversation so that way we can continue to stand in a divided manner that we can't come together and actually have a powerful conversation and be heard collectively and go forward and make some type of progress in this. I would encourage those that try to take it and break it down to those little things to just cut it out. Yeah, because who's winning, right? Who who Who's fighting to figure out who's more oppressed? Because when they see us, we all look the same. And so, <laughs> and I would like to say I've had some of the same experiences as my friends who were born here, you know, getting pulled over and, you know, talked to a certain way or followed in the store just like everybody else. Nobody knows I'm first gen when... <laughs> <laughs> those things happen. So yeah. And why, and it does divide us. Like, why are we fighting to figure out who's more oppressed? We all oppressed. Bingo. Come <laughs> together. You, let's grow. Let's progress. That's my question. Were you in the store still when they was following you? Why? Well, sometimes, they, sometimes they follow you and you're actually still and you need to be followed. <laughs> I may have thought about stealing, but I ain't never stolen anything before. And then you're trying to get her in a public arena. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you fly now? Is that how you live? I, I hold on, no. I knew that she would have the elegance and grace not to admit to stealing, even if she was steal stealing. Anything. No, yeah, like, no, 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 I think I was so straight with Eve Candace. That man said, I knew she would have the elegance and grace not to admit to stealing. Is what you yeah. said. I also don't lie, so you know, I've never yeah. seen anything in my life. <laughs> exactly. I don't associate with lies and thieves. Hey, you a lie right now because you are you're on the hook with at least one. I don't know at least lies one. But um all right, man. So you you were talking a little bit about the manifesting part, right? Yeah. Before I go down my rabbit hole. Which side of manifesting did you take smoke with? And I asked that question saying it this way. Some people need to sit and process some things mentally before they can go forward and go public with it. And I'm not sure if that's the direction you're going with your manifesting no. conversation or if you're I'm talking not. about the people that are screaming about chakras and have never paid attention to a book. Yes, I'm not talking about people who actually manifest. Like, none of these things are, are, are like, even with protecting your energy, I'm not talking about people who are actually living these actions i'm talking about just the overuse of the phrase it's like oh i'm yeah i'm manifesting a good day today uh, look how about you just get off your ass go work out eat breakfast and do the good stuff that's gonna make your day good and telling me how you gonna manifest it yeah i'm gonna good fortunes yes i'm gonna have money this year well are you gonna change your spending habits are you gonna invest more are you gonna pick up another job maybe are you gonna cut your cut your expense like are you gonna do something to have more money or you just go, yes, we manifest. It's like giving it to the Lord in prayer. Okay, yeah, you can give it to the Lord in prayer, but if you don't listen to what comes from the prayer, use the resources around you, you just praying for no damn reason. My favorite is I'm manifesting a husband this year. <laughs> How? How are, you? How are you doing that? Please let me know. While, while sitting yeah. in the house waiting on him to break in. <laughs> <laughs> ain't been nowhere ain't been grocery shopping everybody delivers stuff to you you're gonna manifest it that way yeah you go for it Gr grow him in your bathroom <laughs> he gonna be the uh uber eats delivery driver <laughs> did somebody did somebody grow a boyfriend in a bathtub in a recent netflix show did oh, somebody boyfriend <laughs> Trying to get out. Girlfriend in the bathroom? <laughs> man, I'm just bowls throwing the bones, man. Calm down. I was about to say, oh, okay. I was about Let to say, the bathroom. in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, so that I guess, so guess you more, you more so talking about just the clout of it, so to speak. Yeah. Because most of the people that's doing these things, they're not constantly talking about it. So the ones who pop, pop up one day, oh, this manifestation word look good. Let me use this. It, it sounds it sound good. Well, I'm happy I took Gucci on a walk before this. He over here. Hey, see. Both about to tear up the neighborhood. Okay. I just think that, well, my take on it, I, 
<laughs> for people who don't believe in Jesus, <clears throat> I think manifesting is an easy word to use. Um, I think that it like, you know, came out of nowhere. But I mean, if that's what people want to use, then and it, and it works for them, then they can. But yeah, I think it's weird when people just randomly throw it out and they're not doing any work to get it done. Get it done. I'm with you, Adam. That work can go away. Are there any more that y'all want to get get into before Candace get, goes in on Manish? No, nah, we can uh, we can, we can give the floor to Queen Loveless. <laughs> Candace, can you explain what it means? I don't even know what it means. I will. So this is this is a real country. To me, it's a country statement. Y'all can correct me if you've heard it elsewhere. Um, Adam is smiling because he probably grew up with somebody using the term "manish" in his face. Um, basically, oh, no, because of his actions, <laughs> y'all can go to hell. Why won't you let me be discreet? Why won't you let me be discreet? Let me explain this. So, <laughs> so, manish means is usually used to refer to a little boy acting grown in some sort of way. And the, when I've typically used or heard it, yes, and used it, it's, it's been to refer to a little boy acting grown sexually some sort of way, like um, trying to say something about a girl that's a little fly for him to be as young as he is, or, you know, trying to, I don't know, make certain body movements and things of that nature. Like, look at this little managed boy over here. Um, my conversation is not to necessarily cancel the word. I just realized when it came up that even though it's typically used to describe a little boy acting grown, I thought it was interesting to hear adults use manage to describe adult men too. Um, I'm not quite, I'm not sure what to do with that. I don't, Adam, I don't even remember what you said that made me say, let's talk about manage. Do you? Can, can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. What, what did that word, like, I don't know if I just figured this out, but it, does it come from like being like man-ish? Being like, like a man? Like a man. I ain't never thought about that in 29 years. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Like a man, that's right. Man, that's okay. Man, I just thought it was interesting. Like it just occurred to me to put man and ish together and say, "Oh, acting of the nature of yeah, a just man. Being a man." Okay, but do you, but it's not cute actually to think about a child acting like a man, not only on the child side but also on the man side, because whatever it was that you said was kind of alluding to a man being mannish. Oh, we were talking about you. <laughs> well, me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the about me being mannish. Yeah. You said you were being mannish. And I was like, so you being childish or grown? Not sure. Yeah, being mannish, you know, being a grown man. Can we can we go ahead and talk fast in this conversation as well? The female version yeah. of manish. <laughs> the female version of manish. Can I use that word? Acting fast. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. It's just, you know, having a good time. <laughs> Ricky, your face is like. <laughs> what is your word? Hold on. Let's just cancel, cancel it. Cancel. I don't like it. Cancel it. It's trash. I don't like it. I don't want like <laughs> them. I don't like fast manish. None of it. Just get rid of it. Them words ain't gonna be counseled, sweetheart. Can, can we just, you know, <laughs> it's too much history in that one. You don't even want to fight that bell. <laughs> can we go straight you know? from Kariki's cancellation request into female? But yeah, we, yeah, we can roll really. into that. Adam. I mean, it, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't know it was an offensive term. I was very clear that you do not know. 
Yeah, we was in the uh, we was in the uh, in the Spellhouse uh, Millennials group tech, and, and and some young lady posted um, after you hear the word female or something words to the effect that there's no value after it, and I was like, that's nonsense, because I said use the word female, and I was well intentioned after what I was saying. I was saying something that that, that damn mattered, so she was wrong. But then it turned into the bigger conversation of using the term female to describe women. And I come from the place of, yeah, I'm just referring to you, a woman. Yeah, a female, you know? Like, you know, we we when we do a job application, male, female, you know? No, no malice behind the word at all. But I've since been corrected. <laughs> Bruh, how you get corrected on something that stands as true, though? I don't understand how you got corrected on an objective truth. Because in this world that we live in, people can assign definitions to words and if th- that they deem offensive. Question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. When you're <clears throat> standing in a group, do you say those males over there or do you say those men? I just have a question. I say hard legs. No, shut up, Adam. <laughs> no, literally no one ever says, look at those males. Look at those males over there. Look at them. Hey, the, I don't know how to get there, but the males on the corner might be able to tell you the way. But I don't think many people also say, look at those females. Oh, never mind. They do. I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They say the male chorus. But there's a difference between common diction and inappropriate. The term right. female is a, it's a common it's a common diction it's common in the language and it's not anything outlandish or inappropriate it's a, it's a common term now if we that don't is. like the common term that's a different ball game why why is it common though yeah because it's not a noun it's a it's an adjective right. <laughs> what's wrong what's wrong with the descriptor because female and male are used to describe bathrooms um they're like what bathrooms? when you fill out an application you, they're not asking you what bathroom you use like, yeah they what, ask you can describe like dogs a female dog or a male dog a female alligator or a male alligator yeah, it it speaks oh. to the xxxy genome it speaks to the born nature of the person were you born xx or xy like that I, 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 go I, XXX, XXX. I don't know if it's what, I don't know about if it's what you born. You people at the top of this screen are evading a question. It was asked. I would like to ask my question again, and I hope that you will answer it this time. What's the question? I'm, I'm a listen What's intently, and I'm ready. Why is the use of female common to describe a group of women? and the use of male not common to describe a group of men. Cause y'all chose not to use the word male. It's not y'all, Adam, because- Okay, cancel the second part of the question. Why the answer do, to you, your question. Why do you find it acceptable? Why do you find it acceptable to use half of that dynamic and not the other half? I find it acceptable because when I look at the group, that is the adjective that comes to mind. When I look at the other group, that's not necessarily the adjective that comes to mind. I can only go off of what my brain populates. If my brain populates group of females, group of women, group of, that's what it populates. There's very few scenarios where I've ever looked around the room and be like, wow, it's a group of males over there. Like that, that it doesn't populate like that. That's not the adjective that comes to mind. But here's the thing: if somebody did, if somebody did use that, would you have an issue with it? No. Like if someone looks at you, you you're a male. I'm like you You don't know it because you don't have to experience it. Well, hold on. Just because he wouldn't be offended by it doesn't mean that they can't be offended by it. Now, yeah, I speak for me. I speak for me. I think a lot of the times, from my experience, when I see men say female online, what usually comes after it is not positive. So I've never seen, yeah, I've never seen anyone say um, these women and then something negative all the time. But 
almost all the time I see someone say female on social media, something negative comes after it. And then, of course, there's the whole thing where not everyone is like there are some people who were born female and don't identify as a woman. Yeah, so, yeah. It's the issue more so rooted in in that your experience from it uh, being that way where most of the time you've seen it is something negative come, uh, come, come behind it. Well, that and also it's like, why is it necessary? Why can you just not call us women? Why, why does it always have to seem like it's some type of inferiority thing? Like, why can't we just be called women if that's what we want to be called? I don't, yes, what you say makes absolute sense. But I think that from the male perspective, that's not a conversation that's had commonly enough because I did not realize using the term female was offensive at all. So I think there are a lot of men who speak from, who come from a place of ignorance and not malice. Like just not knowing that it's disrespectful to call women females because not many women would be like, uh, please don't call me female. And like, all right, whatever, bitch, shut up. You know what I mean? Like, and then that's okay too, right? But and, and that's an, and that's another conversation where it's like, hold on, hoe and bitch is okay, but females not. I'm confused. Hey man, I I struggle with it. Um, as I sit here now, I understand for you two ladies. That is a term when you hear it. I understand the way that it has been primed, the way that when you hear it, you you feel that something negative is coming, and I get it. I actually didn't say that. You're, you're correct. You did not. <laughs> KP's language. I apologize for putting KP's language on you. I stand corrected. I'll draw, I'll draw that back, okay? For me, I stand hard on it. It's an adjective. It, it works. I, we can look back into... We'll, we'll go to Genesis. Male and female created he them. It, it's it's there. I don't. I've never looked at it with a negative connotation. Um, so whenever I hear it, I just say, okay, that's the gender that's over there. I think I think to hide to specifically highlight the reason why I mentioned that I didn't say that when I did is because I think the issue that I see with females is that usually when it's used, it is to lump women's thoughts and behaviors into one thing. Um, so you kind of like use the, have the spirit of female in my eye without saying, without saying the words right then. Um, and that, and that is what I see as being the problem with it, which I do think to be fair is inherently derogatory. Um, because you don't like, none of you gentlemen like, um, when men are generalized in a way, um, especially when it pertains to negative behavior, behavior that you don't appreciate being associated with. And, and it's not always that men are saying something negative about women when they're lumping in some way. It's just that there's a dehumanization that occurs when you look at a woman as a woman more than you do a woman as a person. And I think most men look at women more like women than they do people. Like y'all are people, we are women. When you say men and call us females, it even like furthers that distinction. <laughs> Okay. I, pre I appreciate that insight. That's something I can chew on. I know historically when I use the term humans, that gets a lot more flack than it does when I say the term female, but I'm, I'm with it. I understand where you're coming from. I appreciate you sharing that. So that takes you kind spoke, of, you're welcome. So that takes me to another question. Can someone be offended and be wrong? Yes. Can someone be a, okay. <laughs> yes. Just because it bothers you doesn't really absolutely. It. Okay. So is it on you as the person who presents something to be sure that what you're saying is inclusive of all those people that you're talking to? It's a choice. And if 
you're anything like me where you all four stirring the pot up on something not so how do we so where do we draw that line for what's okay to be offended by and what's like absolutely not i don't draw the line man i say something that bothers you that's for you to work out you go figure out why it bothered you you can come converse with me about it and then based on what was said if i if i find myself in a position where what i said was legit an issue then i'll i will make my apology in sincerity and kind of clean that up but at the end of the day if we had to be cautious about every word that we spoke to a manner in which we're concerned about offending someone we'll walk around muzzled i'm confident before this conversation is over before this podcast is over today adam the four of you will be offended by something i say i have issues i'll go with it if it's if we ever get to a point where we can't just speak freely and then communicate about what was said and why it was offended I think we lose a lot of human interaction, but you're allowed to feel however you want to feel, just like I'm allowed to converse however I like to converse. And if you don't like my conversation, we can always leave one another's presence, but you can feel how you want to feel. You're not wrong for feeling. Feeling's good. And I think that this particular topic is like a general topic, but like if any of you, if I said something or called you something and you don't like that and express to me that you don't like that, I probably won't call you that again. Not to say I won't go call somebody else that, but I probably won't call you that again because you asked me not to. But that doesn't mean that I'm gonna do it for everybody else. If the other person is not saying that they're offended by it, then there's a good chance that I may or may not I mean, you know, follow what I'm doing for you for them. So it just depends. You know, Kariki, that, that is so respectable. Do what now? Go I ahead. I was saying that, that was I was saying that's respectable. Cause I look at Lovelace on a regular basis and I'd be like, What's up, Pampin? And she'd be like, Sir, do not refer to me as that in any capacity. But it comes out of my mouth so naturally in conversation. What, what was it? Oh, Pimpin. I'm sorry. Pampin, Clea. Pimping, yeah, I don't like it. Thank you. Yeah, she said the same thing. Hey, Chew. Yeah. Chew. What's up? What was just discussed, you know, it takes me to a, 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 a quote that I've used for probably about two years now, you know, about what Kariki saying, how she may not say something in one place because it's not acceptable, but say it in another place when it is acceptable, you know. That's why I say I call the bitches bitches because the bitches love it. You know what I mean? Because where it's acceptable, it's acceptable and they love it. And then the women's get mad when I say that because they thinking that I think that all women's is bitches, but all women ain't bitches. It's just the bitches are the bitches. Women's? Women. Hey, it, made, it made perfect sense to me, bro. I, I, I don't use it the way you do, but it makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> I won't try to understand it. Thank you. It makes no sense to me. It's actually very simple, but you know, with, with yeah, you know. I mean, no. I, I hear him. It just don't make no sense. Your name is what you respond to. So if you respond to a certain name, I'm going to call you by your name. That's all. So you're saying here in this house that you have called a woman bitch and she has said yes? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. I've seen it happen before. I won't yeah. say... By who, wow. but I've seen it happen. Yeah. Yep. So, but there, there are females who called each other bitch and responded to it. Yeah, just like it's niggas who call each other nigga and responded to it. That's true. I'm sorry, I ain't mean to. I'm, my bad. There are women who have called each other bitch and have responded to it. I am sorry. I'm working on. It. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I didn't do that. Literally, intentionally. Literally, that was that was not intentional. It just rolled off like pimp and roll off uh, Wayne mouth when he see you, Ken. I know, and I don't. I don't want to disrespect your apology. I am appreciative of you. I just think it's interesting how you literally acted out what Kariki said. No, and that's true. But I never, I never said she was wrong. You, you, <laughs> this, this, this point out is for the people. Oh, okay. Yeah, the people. Well, it just happened. So. 
Candace, do you want to tell your robot dream first or, or present your apology? I'm going to tell my robot dream first so okay. I can explain to Kariki what happened um, and to the rest of Earth, who has no idea what we're talking about. Um, also, because it kind of ties into this female's conversation. So one day, one day I had a dream <laughs> that... Um, that all the women in the world had been somehow um, entranced and were now robots um, for the purpose of doing men's bidding, right? So men were doing, I guess, all of the thoughts um, based work and, you know, politicking in the earth and all these things. And women all basically were like Stepford wives. Um, and in the dream, I knew that I was a robot. Like I was having these moments of like awakening, like there was a life before where I was now, but I couldn't like get out of the spill, whatever the spill was. So eventually, um, in the end, though, I did like wake up and I discovered myself in this Morehouse dude's house that I have never dated, by the way. But it's a real person and I was trying to get out. That was it. It sounds like. <laughs> it was rough. It sounds like a paradise for me. Uh, what you mean? Yeah. It sounds like about women being robots. You can program them to do exactly what you want. Bruh. Yo, yo. I'm yo, not yo. serious. I ain't buying it. <laughs> I'm not serious at all. Y'all think I would really just come out and, and, and hang on that cliff alone? <laughs> Crazy things have happened. Would you be alone? He definitely wouldn't be alone. I wouldn't be with him, but he wouldn't be alone. Yeah. <clears throat> you might be you might be uh kicked out of my circle, but <laughs> folks out there. Nah, there's some folks I, out there that'll that love to run with you. Yeah. Nah, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm I mean it's it's people. folks out there that are it's it's males out there that are uh living their life. I see your game. <laughs> Twist on it for y'all. <laughs> I see your game. <laughs> so when you were sitting in this uh nightmare they, they are dreams too what was your takeaway that's a great question sir oh thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> my takeaway um was that it's not entirely my dream was not entirely a figment of my imagination um i actually think i may have had the dream in some part because around that time i think maybe this happened after the dream so i might be appropriating it onto this but around that time i think we were having a conversation about women uh like the social media face of women like um that conversation was before you told us about the dream right so i think something was in my head about that conversation maybe something else had kind of come up you know to make it alive for me at the moment but there was you know like the, the kind of kim kardashian look yes um, no we were talking about somebody who had that look or some lip fillers you know the mm -hmm. IG lip filler color of your uh of your um your sweater face you know all of that black hair mm -hmm. yeah you know, straight hair yeah I, waist this I, I, ass all the way out here though you know what i mean titties with the same with the same um cleavage lines all that shit same perfect cleavage and everything yeah mm -hmm. i know what you're talking about yeah, there were a couple of examples that we had found and it was maybe it was a meme that was like, why does everyone look why does everyone look the same or why is like this the one aspiration? I think Wayne had determined it was like a walking Bratz doll. Sounds about right. Mm -hmm. It sounds horrible, man. 
and I, I refer to it as a nightmare because I can't imagine being in a space where there's no charisma in the room. There's no personality. There's just a bunch of people droning around. Ugh. Well, that's what culture is moving towards right now. You a lot. We're, we're, we're getting to a place where people are being silenced for having different views. And some of those views are so ignorant that they probably should be silenced. But it makes people who, again, come from a place of ignorance and not malice, it makes them afraid to speak what they want to speak. And we all have to fall in line because something is offensive to Wayne. It's supposed to be offensive to me. And I'm supposed to be sympathetic and empathetic to all of everyone's needs and including my own at the same time and then you know social media culture and these algorithms they manipulate what we see and what and, and what goes into our heads so then we keep seeing this one look of of what beauty becomes and, and girls think that they're supposed to look like that in order to be beautiful so then they start pulling towards that so now you got one side of society being afraid to speak their truth and just falling in line to what culture says is the truth and not pushing back on it. And then you have women wanting to look like one woman because apparently this is the look to have, this is the way to act, to have life together. And we are just slowly stripping away free thought. And then we're going to have a society of fucking robots, but it's not just going to be the women. It's going to be the men too, because so many men are paralyzed to the way they're supposed to act, the way they're supposed to look based off of what they see. Like how many people out here, are 25 years old trying to figure out life and thinking they're supposed to make it. Like, no, bro, the people who make it by 25 are the exception. They're not the norm. That's fair. I think because you added, you put a couple of things together and those are, those are some pretty tough conversations if we really dive into it. There's one part of the conversation where it sounds like we're speaking towards the acceptance. I want to be accepted by society in mass. I want to... I want humans to look at me and see me as someone that is the standard of social media beautiful versus me coming to grips with who I am as a person and being okay with who I am as a person. I am going to paint my face or do makeup, whatever that devil's paint stuff happens, paint my face and present contour lines and things in that nature to be acceptable to the general public versus being confident and okay in who you are as a person. I think some root cause analysis needs to happen in that scenario. So you can figure out why so many people had this burning desire to look like one human. I, I would argue that's one of the pieces that need to be invoked. Lovelace, I saw your lips moving, but I don't know what came out your face. I was trying to figure out if you call makeup devil paint. Yeah, the devil's paint. That, oh, that, okay. that, Just yeah. wanted to make sure I heard you right. Thank you. Oh yeah, no. Why is the not devil's paint? paint? Bruh, it is the, let me go ahead. Let's pause today, Adam. It is the most deceitful item in the beauty market. And it's available to many. We have seen human beings you forgot put about that Botox. stuff on. Say it again. You forgot about Botox. I think, it, I think it's worse than makeup. It might be worse, but it's not as deceitful because it's not as available. The right. value, Make, the, makeup is yeah. more accessible. Yeah, you can spend 10 minutes at Ulta Beauty and you can come out of there prepared to look like a whole new human being. Like what makeup has done and what people have been able to do with makeup and how they've been able to not just change, enhance their appearance just to, you know, get a little confidence boost. They came out whole new shades of a person. You went from being my complexion to walking around Lovelace's complexion. And that was, I mean, there was a lot of fun and painting and rubbing on and stuff to happen, but that's the way that I've witnessed some of these transformations. And I sit there in shock and awe. Why, how does a person get to a point where they are so uncomfortable with what they see in the mirror that they 100% change everything that's going on with their presentation? I'll bite my tongue for the sake of conversation before I go into the conversation pertaining to uh, the bleaching of skin and the lightening of skin, which is crazy in the Asia region. But go ahead. Not all makeup is bad. <laughs> I think that it depends on who's using it, right? Like 
we are all given tools that can be manipulated into something that's bad. So, I mean, whether it's you taking a Tylenol because you have a headache and then overdosing or you, me putting on lipstick and then someone like transforming themselves into somebody completely different. I, I, I like makeup and I watch makeup artists who are really good at what they do to it's, they describe it as an art form and not necessarily, you know, <laughs> it's some Van Gogh type shit. Say again. It's some Van Gogh type shit. Yeah, I mean, it takes a skill to do that. I do think that there are women out there who think that they have to do that every single day, and there are people who are not comfortable with the skin that they're in, and there are people who want to look like other people. So it's not, basically I'm saying like it's not. I don't think it's the devil and I don't I don't think like it's a monolithic thing. I think that people use it for different reasons, you know, whether it's to enhance your beauty. Maybe you've been in a pandemic for however long and you want to put on some makeup because you haven't been anywhere. You know, I think everyone does something different with makeup. Yes, ma'am. I mean, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm here to pod today. So when I speak to and call it the devil's pain, I call it the devil's pain in the same capacity that we call marijuana the devil's grass. Like, it's not in and of itself a horrible thing. However, when used to alter, to deceive, to work outside of its original context, I think you're a little skeptic for me. I... I've seen I've seen two I've seen some crazy transitions out there. And by crazy I mean you were a whole man and now you literally look like a whole young lady. And that's courtesy of the art and the skill that came with applying that makeup. You literally changed your whole beard, didn't shave it, it just went away because you understood the art of application. And then you did your contouring and all those other things and bada bing bada boom. I don't I don't recognize you based on that X X X Y thing anymore. When I think of Candace's robot dream, I thought of a story that this girl I knew told me where she would go to bed with her man, her partner in full makeup. And um, she would um, have her hair done and then he would sleep. And then she would get up in the morning, wash her face, do her hair again and put her makeup back on, get back in the bed. And then when he like wakes up, this is what he sees. The same person who he went to bed with last night and not her actual self. Ma'am. Girl. Let me share with you. Here I am, all of my hedonistic ways. I'm sitting in Sunday school. Yes, I went to Sunday school, Chew. And while I'm sitting in Sunday school, a young lady shared that same conversation. She said, my husband will never see me with my face undone. And I said, how is that? And like, y'all don't swim, y'all don't, never mind. Not, that part's not important. But I was just like, really? And she goes to bed last and she wakes up first. And her intent is to never be seen unpainted. I found myself shocked, but I want you to know you're not the only person that has had that conversation. Wayne, I'm about to tell you there's this thing that there is makeup that you can swim in and it doesn't come off. <laughs> I can only take your word for it. That, it sounds exhausting to, to live that way. Bruh. My body said the thing about doing this all day. Like, get, get what? Yeah. Like, like, what kind of man is, is demanding that his woman be all day, every day? Like, it wasn't a demand, it was her choice. Uh huh. But, uh huh. Yes. But, 
this is unpopular conversation, not for Kariki <laughs> and me, but for you all, perhaps. Oh, they don't want to have that. You, I'm sorry. What? When you are in relationship with someone, whether it is a committed non-married relationship or a married relationship, I'm just going to use those that range of examples, okay? And you frequent the people's social media space. Let's just stick with Instagram for the time, all right? And you make it your regular business to like, comment, subscribe to the pages of every beautiful fitness model that you see. Um, it's a little mixed messaging, depending on and leave your hand down, depending on who you are and how you live the rest of your life, okay? For example, if the people that you like, comment on, subscribe, look like who you're out here trying to date, then the only question that I have, if I have one even, is does that dynamic work for y'all's relationship? Are you, sir, for example, also cool with sis um, blowing up Michael B. Jordan post with heart eyes, reposting or putting Steph Curry in her stories like this nigga fine. OK, is that OK? If it is, then you know, y'all live your life. You get a close friend. OK, and, and people can feel your close friends. They don't have to see it. It's in your spirit. So the thing about most guys, though, is that the person who they dating or trying to date, beautiful women, gorgeous women, but they don't look like your social media prototype. I'm not saying that everybody has to make the same decisions, but some people's way of coping with this persistent issue is trying to morph themselves into what it looks like you like. It is a decision for show. However, it's not from nowhere. It didn't fall out the sky. Thank you. But Candace, there, um, there are also men who vocalize that they want their women to dress that way, to wear her hair that way, to put her makeup on that way. And yes, it's still a choice. She doesn't have to do all that. But, you know... The brain is an interesting thing. The mind, the way it works. So to, get to to respond to what Candace was saying, you know, it's such thing as liking turkey, chicken, steak, shrimp. You know, you can like different types of meat. You know, I eat a lot of chicken. Chicken, you I eat chicken throughout the week. I, you know, chicken is chicken is your old lady. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, reliable. You love it. Good enough for me. Yeah, I love me some good chicken. <laughs> you know, lobster is what I look at on Instagram. I'm not eating this every day. I I, I like it, but this ain't what I want. And, and, and me, my love for chicken is no, no less devalued by my love for lobster. That's all. Bruh. I don't that is a horrible comparison. <laughs> terrible. That was horrible. terrible. First of all, that was so terrible because my man is going to call me a lobster. If that's what the greatest thing to him is, I'm going to be a lobster. I don't want to be no chicken. I, that other girl over there, she chicken. I don't care if you eat chicken every day. I'm lobster. Mm -mm. I need to understand how the sea roach lobster gave something to look at. Like, nah, bro, look, I understand where you're trying to go with it. But I, here's where I stand for you. There's a difference, Lovelace, in what catches your eye and what connects your soul. Just because something turns your head doesn't mean you want to be present with it on a regular basis. There's a whole lot of shiny objects out there, and it's not hard to get distracted. But it doesn't mean that that's necessarily something that you want to be in a space with. And I find myself concerned about those that are extremely drawn to those 
that have a image that they're trying to keep and they they make their living off of projecting that image and we find ourselves eating it up. I find myself concerned about it, but for the chicken to the lobster to the steak piece, I don't know, big dog. Like, eh, yeah, that ain't that don't sit well. Well, yeah, no, I'm just you know creating content here, but on a, on a serious I know you was adamant, note, but he but he's on to something. He's not, it's, that also didn't come from nowhere, and he is also not alone. No, but but I, I think that on to what Wayne was saying is is there there's things that you can look at, and there's things that you can actually live with. And I can, I can, shit, I can like a, a, a Lamborghini. Uh, here you go, here I go with another bad reference. I can like a Lamborghini, but I'm not trying to drive that every single day. And not from the sense that we're getting to the value of cars, which is better. I talk about which is better for me, which is more valuable for me. When I bought my truck, I was in between buying a, a two door luxury car or, or, or a truck. And I said, what the hell? usefulness does this small car have for me i with my truck i can move stuff around i can keep stuff i can keep stuff in the back if i if i need it if i end up in a situation where um i'm supposed to stay with somebody and they get drunk and don't answer the phone i can sleep on my back seat because it's plenty long enough and i keep a blanket back there you know what i mean so like you you get what works for you and what might be of high value to one person may not be high value to another so I'm here with you. I'm investing my time. I'm investing my space. I'm investing my resources with you. For, 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 from coming from from someone like me, that's the sign that this is what I like. This is the look that I like. Like I like a little extra something around around here. You know, a little stretch mark, a little say like ain't nothing wrong with those imperfections. But that doesn't mean that if Meg the Stallion posting some knees challenge that I can't just like that too. But I don't want to live with that. Like that shit's annoying. It's good for this small space that I'm in. Like, oh yeah, hey, huh? But not for this real life that I'm actually trying to live. I hear you, bro. I hear you. I know. It comes down to preference, and I want to try to avoid um, the comparison thing. I just know for me, I don't prefer to be with the woman that is going to have to take out of the twenty-four hour day one hour putting on the devil's paint and then another hour taking it off so she can rescue my pillows. Like, I, I don't, that's my preference though. I don't need two hours a day of you hiding yourself and then revealing yourself at the end. Like, I'm good. You can just, I prefer what I call natural raw in my, in my presence. But that's right. All right, so can I see your apology? Oh, hold on. Before we get to your apology, I got a question. Back to your robot dream, and I think we missed it. Now you said you woke up in somebody's bed that you that you hadn't been with, you hadn't dated. Is I said person, house. House. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Now you woke up in someone's house. Now is that someone's house that you feel like you may need to be in or is that somebody who's been on your mind or somebody that you may should reach out to because you woke up in their house and maybe there's a home for y'all to build together? Nah. Or what room or the house did you wake up in? I feel like I was in a closet. <laughs> no. Like it was somewhere I, dark and kind of enclosed. Like oh, he, just pulled, he just pulled you out when you're ready to show you up. See what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> It was, a, it was a real random person too, like somebody who, like it did the the fact that I woke up in his house in his closet don't even fit what I know of his character. So I don't know what what that was. That dream about just being present and not having control of yourself sounds a lot like another version of sleep paralysis to me. And I want it, it don't sound like what I know of your character either, Kenneth. I ain't hiding or stuck in the closet. That sounds wild and out of control. I was as good. I was a robot. I was as good as a, a Roomba. A whole Roomba. A whole Roomba. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I was getting out. I was getting out though. I really was. By direction or by your own, by yourself? Uh, it was by myself. I had finally Ooh. been able to break the robot spell, and I was on escape plan immediately. 
I was actually surprised to have been in his house. I was like, why am I here? And then I left. Made more interesting. Never mind. You run for stuff now? No, I just don't. I'm just made more interesting by the fact that I didn't have any sort of like interaction with him in school. I mean, like, except saying hello. You gotta, <laughs> that's a lot of you got a lot of admirers that you ain't had much interaction with, Kent. Hey, we're gonna run from that topic right now. Well, yeah, what was about to say? <laughs> Nah, you know, I, I I didn't have anything important. No, we can we can talk about that topic about Candace and her admirers. We ain't going to that next time. No, nah, we ain't doing that. You hell, get out of here. We ain't, oh, we ain't got time you. for that. Let's talk about Candace's apology. Um. Okay, so first of all, I would like to say give two disclaimers. The first disclaimer is I would love to hear what Kariki's perspective is on this before y'all's, if she would like to share before y'all. The second one is that this apology is from me and not from all the females. So, <laughs> so. From who? Not, not from who? The females. Oh, wow. Interesting. Very. Um, I don't remember what the post was that we saw that prompted this apology. It was something that was, if anybody remembers, just say something. Um, there was something about, it was like a meme, but it was a pretty egregious statement by a woman who essentially, it looked to me, wanted a man to have done something for her consistently but she had not at all let him in on the fact that it was something that she desired or would be helpful to her and she was pretty much prepared to just like cancel him and put him off to the side on account of that it was it was very egregious though like it wasn't that basic it was something that was like and then f him and all of y'all because of this I shouldn't have to say pretty much. It was not only that the meme existed, but also the comments were like they ended it ended up having to be that the comments were disabled because there were so many of people responding with exactly, yes, right, exactly. And even some dudes underneath period. Period poo. And even some dudes underneath being like, yeah. Um, you shouldn't have to go through this. Um, but it it just didn't feel like a you shouldn't have to go through this situation to me only because she had been overt about the fact that I'm not telling a dude to do this for me. And it wasn't like a basic thing either. So anyway, my thought when I saw it was there really is a culture in um, a lot of space, not just in women's space, but in men's space, where some of us have been taught that men are supposed to do certain things for us without us having to say so or without us having to express our desires or our feelings um, around a thing. And I just, for once, thought about how that might feel from the male perspective. And I felt bad about it uh, because I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want the expectation that I was doing something that I didn't know was desired of me to be done. And then not only was I held accountable for it in like a conversation that was ongoing, but I also was like completely wiped off the mat because I didn't do it and I didn't know. Like I didn't even have a chance to come back from it. And all the females were canceled too because I didn't do <laughs> this thing. So I have some ideas culturally about where that, where that idea that men should do certain things comes from without women's explanation. But I would like to apologize 
um, for the time that I believe I might have carried on some of that idea consciously or subconsciously without being willing or desiring to converse about it or explain anything that might be helpful. Um, I think there are lots of other options in how to converse and how to get a point across and even how to respond uh, up to and including at the very minimum communication about this didn't work for me so that we can figure out what to do from there. But just canceling somebody entirely for doing that, I think as a, like a person period is not cool. And it looks to me like it happens in y'all space a lot of time. Um, just in the particular dynamic between a woman you might be romantically interested in and yourself. So there are many things like this. I think that men also, unfortunately, ways men respond to women that are similarly unhelpful. Um, but this is a thing that I definitely saw from the other side. So, <laughs> I think it's unfair. That's the first thing I'm going to say. It's unfair that someone would expect someone else to know what they want without expressing it verbally that they want that thing. I mean, and then canceling them because they didn't give them that thing. Uh, I don't think that that's fair. One, we weren't all raised in the same house. So you, you can't expect that how this man or woman was raised to be the same as how maybe your brother was raised. Um, and your maybe, you know, your dad said, you need to do these things for a woman. And then also for a woman, like what if I don't want those things that your dad told you that a woman needs or wants? And then also I wouldn't want someone to have expectations that I'm gonna do certain things because I'm a woman when I wouldn't say that I'm the traditional, you know, woman, like I don't, I don't do those traditional things that someone may want me to do unless they tell me out of their mouth, like I can, I like when you do this. So I don't think it's fair for someone to just cancel someone if they didn't know. I mean, for those of us who go to therapy, it is very encouraged that you use your words and say, I would like this. I like when you do this or something simple. Like I like flowers. I like when you bring me flowers all the time. Like, don't just bring me flowers on Valentine's day. I like flowers every Friday, you know, like say that people won't know that that's what you want unless you actually say that. How am I supposed to know that, that you want that? How would I know that you don't like to pump your gas or wash your car? I'm speaking from the man side. <laughs> How do I know that you don't, that you don't like to take the trash out. Like, I don't know that if you don't say something, I don't think it's fair. And it's very important therapy plug that everyone go to therapy <laughs> and get these tools to use in their toolbox. I think it will help with a lot of relationships and communication because that's where it ends. If you can't communicate that you want something or that you don't like something, then maybe you just aren't ready to be in a relationship at all with anybody. That's all I have for now. I would like to apologize too though, because I do know in my younger age, I had expectations that some people were supposed to do things for me and I never verbalized any of that. So I apologize. Since we on the apology tour, Wayne, too, y'all got some apologies over there y'all wanna get off? Hell no, nah. I ain't apologize for nothing. The end. I'm good. It's okay. If the apologies was offered unto you, so you could just receive it if you please. Oh yeah, yeah. Now that <laughs> ladies, oh, yeah. I do appreciate. Yeah, I do appreciate you sharing um your insights and how those things have been made known unto you. I appreciate those thoughts and KP, I'm sure that those people that walked um, in your path during that time frame, if they stumble across Big Baby's Pod, they will appreciate that as well. Some Chew, I'm going to let you converse first. No, you got it. I'm just, I'm, I'm just sitting back on this. 
Adam, you don't want to bite yet? I mean, for what I think is noble and honorable to have two women here apologizing. Unprovoked, by the way. Because, you know, there's another social media running joke that women don't apologize, which I think is nonsense. It's not been my experience. Maybe I've been around um, some nice women, some women who are in touch with themselves. Maybe they went to therapy or something because I've had a fair share of women apologize to me for things that they did or didn't do and, and so on. But, um, yeah, I, thanks for the apology, Candace, because i tell you what, when I was younger in life, moving, shaking out here in these streets, trying to figure shit out, it's like, hey, you know closed mouths don't get fed. If you don't tell me what you want, you don't tell me what you need, you don't tell me like this bothers you, I'm not going to know to stop it. I'm not Miss Cleo. I, I don't I don't read minds. I don't do tarot cards. I can't tell you what your energy is. You know what I mean? On the 14th day of the lunar polar uh, eclipse and all of that shit. But all I can do is go off of what you tell me and what you respond to. So if you are still here occupying my space and, and allow me into your space, that means that whatever I'm doing is good enough to want you to keep coming back. So I'm going to continue carrying myself in that way. But if all of a sudden something bothers you and then you just want to like cut something off, I think it's, I think it's uh, just immature and it takes us into this, I can love you to death and never speak to you again. Can you? Like, is that, is that loving? Are you, do you truly love that individual to death or, or, or do they just have a place in your heart? You know what I mean? I think that's where it stems from. It's It stems from, I respect you as a person. I appreciate who you are. I admire you. Um, however, there are certain things that I expect and demand of you that you are not capable of presenting. Therefore, with all the love for the things that you do bring to the table, I'm going to have to remove myself from your presence. I think that's a part of it. Um, but that's also feeding into the relearning love conversation that we got to put some time into. What is love? I think, Are you, go ahead. I think that we use the word love so loosely, right? And we generalize, it's a, it's a general term that has so many different meanings because the love that you have for friends and the love that you have for family and the love that you have for a significant other is so different, but you're using the same word. And we all, I, we all, we all view love differently, even though it may mean the same to the same thing to us. Right. So let me see. So you may use love as your word to to separate the your your feeling for any for people, right? So the people that you feel most strongly about, you love. But how is it that you love, and what is your expectation for what love is? Because you can meet someone else who y'all share the same strong feelings and love for each other, but the way in which you carry out those actions are totally different. And to have you feeling or to have them feeling as if the love isn't there because they're judging you off of their definition of love instead of your definition of love. So, yeah, we stand in agreement in reference to some of the things that could um, be a divide in the perception that's on there. The idea of love in the English language is very different than it is in as um, some would allude to the, the Greek language and the original love languages. And even in Latin, we, in our, in our form of English language, we don't have a lot of words pertaining to love, but there are other languages that do, that describe your brotherly love, your familial love, your erotic love. Um, to say what it is in a nutshell is a, is a daunting, daunting task, because there are things that I might describe as an emotion or an affection towards someone that isn't necessarily what I would consider love. Case in point for Dravez, for Adam, I admire and respect your opinions, 
your stance, your journeys, your upbringing, how you all handle yourselves in conversations when you walk in the rooms, your personality, your energy. I admire and I respect those things. I can admire and respect those things without necessarily loving them. However, some would argue that you cannot love something without the admiration and respect. So my battle as I try to identify love in the traditional English sense is it requires an abundance of words just to make it make sense. Yeah, I think that the word love in the English language, we use it for so many different things. You can quickly say, I love food or I love a movie, but do you really love it or you just like strongly like it, you know? And then I think for love, everyone has their own personal definition of what it is and not everybody actually knows what that is for themselves. So I, it, it's a big question. <laughs> what is love? And it's something that everybody has to figure out, I think, on their own. What does love look like to you? Like, what are your expectations for love? And what are you going to give to other people? Um, what level of love are you going to get? Candace and I had this conversation on Thursday. That was what my whole Bible study was about that I talked I just about. about to say. It's so weird. So basically, that's what I asked everybody to do is like go home this week and figure out what your personal definition of love is because it's different, I think, for everybody. Yeah, and I think another oh, thing with that. Okay. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to ask KP, if you don't mind, when y'all do that return thing, if that's something that other humans can jump in on for eavesdropping purposes, I love it. I love to be a part of it. All are welcome in the kingdom. But yeah, I'll say another thing along the lines of that, you know, us figuring out what is love. We got a lot of times we got to understand or get a, a good idea of, you know, knowing that a lot of things that we think we love are actually like like bad addictions. Some people say they love food, but it's past love to it. The way you're using it is unhealthy. And you can say that for relationships. You can say that for weed, alcohol, a lot of different things for social media. You think you love it, but you're probably addicted to it. So you gotta you really gotta understand: is it love or is it something that you're addicted to and that that's actually harmful to you? Mm. Yeah, I, we struck I like up. where you're going with that conversation. Go ahead. I, I don't really have anything for it because I'm starting to think like you start thinking about people's relationships now, right? Like specifically, where they quote unquote love each other but they treat each other like shit, but they keep coming back. And it is an addiction. And then it kind of triggered me a little bit because I, I used to refer to myself as crack. I'm good to you, but I'm awful for you. <laughs> I think oh, you have. So just spoke a reverse word to yourself. I mean, it's where I was at in life. It, I mean, it wasn't wrong. But nonetheless, I think the love versus addiction conversation is, is an important conversation because how often do we really think of stuff that way? Like, oh, I'm addicted to this person. Or you, you hear the jokes like I'm addicted to the dick or I'm addicted to the pussy. You know what I mean? Like you hear people say it, but then you don't really like look at it and evaluate it as a addiction, like a toxic addiction, like uh, addiction, like fame, atten uh, attention, you know, drugs, um, gambling, whatever, whatever that case may be. We don't think about it like that, but we have these toxic addictions to people. And is there really rehab for that? I, I feel like a, an early rehab step is exactly what, um, like Kariki said, we're doing as an activity in her Bible study with Rooted Wellness this week. I think it's helpful to figure out what your definition of love is. Not necessary, and I know that exercise is gonna be different for everybody, but I just think it's 
determining what your definition of love is may be different from what your definition of love should be. So if you're really honest with yourself um, about doing that exploration, what is my definition of love? Like if you really take that seriously, you can come up with like a lot of things may reveal themselves to you as perhaps actually addictions um, rather than things that describe love. For I'm trying to think of an example. Okay, so we just talked about food here. We talked about food there in Bible study too, right? You asked the question, Kariki, what feeling, what's your favorite food and then what feeling does it give you? And then why do you feel like that when you eat the food? Like, and I, th I think about doing the exploration of what your definition of love is like that. My definition of love is people speaking kindly to me. Why? What does that make you feel like <laughs> when they do that? I feel respected. Okay, that sounds pretty healthy. My definition of love is someone um, texting me they get, that they get home every night. Why do, or what do I feel when that happens that I like? I feel validated. There might be more questions there. <laughs> Maybe the validation is fair. Maybe it's a little, I don't know. And I think you can feel that if you really get into the activity and maybe even like involve somebody and ask them for their help. And then we also talked about like what benefit, what, like when, if you love something or somebody, is there some benefit that you're getting? Are you only loving them because mm -hmm. you get something in return? Like, is that your true definition of love because you're getting something in return or do you just love them as they are? Yeah. I think every relationship that we have with people, we get something in return for it. And if we didn't get anything in return from that relationship, we wouldn't have the relationship because it would make absolutely no sense. And that's some, and it's a, it's a kind of a cruel way to put relationships, but I, you get something out of it. If we didn't get anything out of having conversations together, we wouldn't have the conversations, whether it's the, the love that we receive from the people, whether it's the information that we receive from the people, whether it's the status that we receive from the people, whether it's the physical feelings that we get from those people, whatever it is, every relationship has a something I we all gain something from relationships. Now, do we need what we're getting from that relationship? That's another question. But we are all in our, all, all of our relationships are self-interested, even if we don't have our best self-interest at heart. Well said, y'all. Well said. So what's next on the list? Uh, what else we talking about? You, like, you act like you're trying to preach a little bit, I feel. No, no, no. I, I can't I can't come from the pulpit with this cup. That wouldn't be right. Um, so another thing about relationships, it was some uh post that I saw and I think it was one that Candace wanted to talk about too. She pretty much drove this whole this whole segment here. Uh you disrespect yourself when you rekindle a relationship that humiliated you. And to open it up. For me, it depends on who you're looking to please and what matters to you. Because do I think that retreads on relationships typically work? No, but it's not because one person, one person's inability to change. Or but I but I look at it as: Are you going to forgive the the events that caused the relationship to end when you go back into it are you going to be able to give this person the benefit of the doubt that they lost in a previous relationship um are you going to give them are you going to give them grace are you going to understand the growth that may have occurred while you weren't in their life and if you are going to give that person a fair chance and that person and you and yourself have done the adequate work to make that relationship work and function for you no, it's not embarrassing, but if it's just we're going to take a three month pause just so he can go soil his royal oats or she can just go do what she needs to do and, and, and there's no actual healing process, no growth done, 
then yeah, you're embarrassing yourself because you're just doing something that ain't going to work. I feel you. I think embarrassment, the idea behind it is external opinions looking into your life. Well, fuck them. They don't live in the house. They don't pay the bills. They don't make me happy. You don't pay my bills. You don't You don't give me thrills. Then, then, then what the hell are you talking about? You know what I mean? Ooh, ooh. Okay, I like this game. Let's go with it. However, I, I validate your existence by giving you my opinion. I, I tell you the things that are important, and I allow you to understand that the things that are happening around us, they're not just you. They impact others, and that person that you keep going back to, it makes the group look bad, Adam. Well, hell, that's y'all's problem. Kick me out the group, because if that person makes my home happy, where, where I need to get my inner peace, y'all can go to hell, because I'm happy at home. But Adam, you're not happy at home. You keep coming here sharing it with us. It's all bad. Yeah. This is all fictitious. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is all, all, all fictitious. <laughs> okay. Uh, home as happy as can be, you know. <laughs> but like, um, <laughs> yes, I feel embarrassment is external, and I think that we need to talk about that. Then why are you? Why is everything in the relationship so outwardly facing for everyone to have an opinion? Because you're only humiliated and embarrassed when everybody knows your business. So I think we need to unpack that. Like, why are you telling, why is a person telling everybody their business or letting everyone into their relationship? I think because it's cheaper than therapy. It's easier for me to sit down with my unlicensed friend whose opinion I respect and get their insights about a situation or a scenario and then use that as if it was actually viable to me to progress and grow than it is for me to keep things internal and communicate effectively. And when I say communicate, it's not just say words, transition, point A, point B, words, words, words. It's make sure that there's a comprehension of things that are being presented from both parties involved. It's easier for me to look at my circle, pick up my phone, hit AC, hit CHU, and say, hey, man, these are my thoughts. And that's the challenge that's there with keeping things private is you 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 have people that you want to bounce ideas off of and sometimes those opinions are important and sometimes they shouldn't be Ooh, like telling your mama yeah that's top 10 people i don't tell anything to right there whole neighborhood know the situation <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing i was about to say it's important to have like i know if i bring something to y'all it's, it's not going to be y'all taking my side. It's going to be the truth or your truth. But I don't, if I bring something to you, I'm not expecting you to always take my side because I know I'm not right in every situation, probably more situations than I'm, I'm wrong more, in more situations than I, than I am right. But um, a lot of people is, they just, they just got that, they got that comfort with other people because they're going to tell them what they want to hear. And that's not, that does, that's not going to work in any relationship or with any relationship or just, just conversation period. And you know, you got, I think the one thing about talking about certain things, because we do have the people in our lives who we share things to who are with, who aren't licensed, sometimes just to get it off your chest, sometimes to get, to get feedback, you know, and, and you just say some things out loud and you, and you hear it differently, but you also have to know the people who you can share that with, who will give you, who give you their truth but we'll also not judge in that relationship. You know, like, like the person who will say, yeah, bro, you tripping by going back to her cause you know how she is. And if you want to put up with that, you know, at the end of the day, you grow up, I'm gonna let you put up with, with what you want to put up with. But I'm gonna tell you, put up with some bullshit. You need also need those people in your life because you don't want, you don't want to have the person who, who then, forges this this builds this grudge against somebody who you're keeping around for reasons that you gave because you gave them information or whatever but they're holding a grudge that you well gotten over which is why i mean i don't tell people things that i don't tell people things to where i care if there's if there's a grudge going to be there if i care how they truly feel about that person that person's existence in my life Yeah, I think it's fair to have a level of uh, privacy 
and respect of matters pertaining to people when you have a common circle um, to prevent opinions from being formed from a one-sided conversation. Yeah, that's why you don't make circles. You have a bunch of different circles out here and you keep everything separate, right? I would, I would argue you probably shouldn't date in your circle either, but we can spin that I, one up. So I would argue we probably shouldn't date in our circle either, but we can spin that up. Oh, yeah, no, nah, I don't believe in dating in the circle because I, not even just dating in the circle. <laughs> I mean, my my friend circle, my my close friend circle. I don't believe in dating in my close friend circle. And I definitely don't believe in um, sexual relations in the friend circle in which there is uh and ambiguity to what the relationship is because when you when you have a fucking inside the friend circle it, stuff gets get, gets really weird because you don't know who you can invite sometimes because it's like uh you know shorty gonna be here like i don't know you bring in someone so like now we gotta start thinking about just dinner and stuff because of what y'all had going on and are y'all going to be cool today? Y'all going to be tripping. If if she show up with some new dude or we all go out and somebody hollering at her, you going to be in your feelings now just because of y'all's old. Oh, ain't nobody got time for all that extra shit to be thinking when it a thousand fish in the sea, just go find, you know, just go play around in somebody else's a, a, a school of fish instead of your own. I'm going adv- to be an advocate again. I'm going to do that devil's advocacy thing. But that's where the bonds are formed. When you're in the common spaces and you're hanging out, that's where you manifest that relationship where you sit in that space with that person and y'all have detailed conversations. And through those conversations, what ends up happening is your interests is peaked because you get insights into how they carry themselves in various dynamics and that is learned. So if they don't find ourselves interested or if we don't find ourselves interested in spaces or in the people that's in our circle all the time, where do we find a person at, bro? Like at some point that that divide is tough. But if you're not sharing that space with the people and building the bond that way, you know, we were friends first. The opportunities are limited because the idea of dating strangers outside of an app is boring. Like you don't, there's very few people that can walk up to someone on the street and have the charisma to convince them to go out on a date. Well, I feel like if you're gonna date in the friend circle, you just gotta remove yourself from the friend circle once y'all start dating. You gotta do what? Just back away from the friend circle. He said, remove yourself from the circle. Mm. Both you know, people? Both people should remove themselves from the circle. No, uh, on a serious note, I just think you have to draw. You have to uh, create uh, parameters within that group so that they understand shit, and then that you and your partner, more specifically, understand how how you're going to carry yourself when you have mutual friends and stuff. Because if you find yourself in a breakup space where there's mutual friends, you may be operating mutual. You may be operating in mutual spaces before you have done the healing that you may have wanted to do before you occupied space with that person. So you just have to make an understanding within you two that, you know, you, the information that you're comfortable being out if you plan to still move in that circle. Now, if you say, fuck this circle, I ain't gonna be around y'all no way, then disclose whatever and not care about what size the people in the uh, circle choose when the breakup happens. Because nine times out of ten, they're going to pick sides. People aren't going to necessarily be able to separate. Hey, that's their business. It has nothing to do with the relationship that I have with this individual. I feel you. When you said that word healing, I think it triggered me. And I wanted to add that to my list of words that needs to be banned. But we'll we'll, we'll pick that up another time. What's wrong with healing, Wayne? We don't have to because you're going to get a lot of argument from me on that one. Here we go. So for the idea of healing, I think people say it, but they have no intent correction. I perceive no intention of actually growing or attempting to grow through that conversation based on their actions 
and behaviors. We use the language of our, I'm trying to heal, but in reality, the steps that I would consider healing look nothing like the actions that person is taking. I think that people are confused <laughs> and that they probably don't understand that it takes time. I think that we live in a society that wants everything to happen very quickly. You know, we have microwaves and instant pots and everything happens so fast. We have the internet. And when they use the word healing, I don't think that they understand. I don't think that, that I think there's a group of people who do not understand that it's going to take a while. And you're going to have to do this work for a very long time because you are basically trying to invoke change in yourself. And you've been this way for a while. So, yeah, <laughs> I like the word healing, but I think people need to probably understand it a little bit more. I agree with you. The it's um the part that particularly stands out to me about what you just said, Kariki, is the time aspect. And particularly you're pointing out something like if you're doing something different that has been a part of your life for a very long time, it's gonna take a long time it would be reasonable for it to take a while to heal through that. If I'm trying to heal from something that's been going on in my space for 20 years, I'm, I may not be appearing to be moving very far to you and by the third or fourth year, <laughs> but it's been in my life for 20 years. So it could take me years <laughs> to be able to evolve in a way where it looks to you like something different has happened to me. And I think, though I understand what you're saying, Wayne, my concern with um, the particular words you use, which I don't think most people are as conscious of when they use them, is it don't look, what you doing don't look like healing to me. But you don't, you can't say that people, you know, like all people in by and large, you can have that to say, but you can't know what healing looks like for me. Part of healing for me could be blowing up in a conversation one day and then the next day having resolution or offering apology in a different <laughs> conversation. It could all be a part of the healing process. It will not be me, me personally, healing through something will not be me seated in the corner in meditative state uh, for three months and then come out gold. And if that's what you're expecting, then you might, you know, like discover yourself in some different space because we're not going to be able to convene while I heal through <laughs> something. So you, can, I, 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 you would have to give me better rationale then the actions that people take don't look like the ones you would associate with healing in order for me to cancel that word. Two weeks ago, conversation. Um, said a person, I'm trying to get over this relationship. All right, cool. What steps are you taking? Well, I'm going to book a flight and I'm going to fly out there to have a conversation with this person. Okay. Where are you staying at? Oh, I'm staying at their house. The one bedroom? Yeah, the one bedroom. I'm staying there. So you're going to fly out. You're going to stay at the one bedroom and you're going to sit in that space and y'all are going to heal and recover as y'all prepare to separate yourselves from one another. Yes, yes, that's what we're going to do. To Wayne, that doesn't look like healing. To Wayne, that looks like you're putting yourself back in a space to get cut again. Sometimes people's healing process includes them getting cut again. <laughs> Sounds great, boss. I'm just telling you, as a non-expert in the healing category, 
back. I would I would say that's probably not a space that you should sit in. Right now. It might it might not be a place you should sit in. It might not be a space you should sit in, but you still may end up there on your journey to healing. It's a journey, not a exit strategy. Everyone's healing plan is not a strategy. Maybe it should be more strategic, but it's not always like that. Also, go ahead, ma'am. I was just gonna say, I also think that it there's a difference between people that you speak to or see all the time that's healing, and then someone that may have gone away for a while. So I know someone who I haven't spoken to in years who went through a you know tumultuous time, and that person is very different now. But then I also know people who went through a tumultuous time and they're still working on those things. And every once in a while, I'm like, dang, that person is a little teensy bit different now. It takes a long time. And if you see them all the time, you might not notice it. Just like if someone's losing weight, you're not going to notice that that person is losing weight if you see them every day. (laughs) But maybe you'll go on vacation for two weeks and then come back and be like, dang, that person is small. So I think that healing, like, it just depends on who it is. So does it get to a point to where we have to put a, um, put pressure on people to heal? Because I think there are people who enjoy being in pain and they don't move towards the healing that they need. I'm not licensed, bro, so I can't call it. Here's what I can say, though. You only have so many times to call me to talk to me about your situation before I say, man, I'm not your therapist. Uh, you, you, you need to go get some professional assistance because what I'm going to tell you to do, it may devastate you even more. So I can't call it. Here's what I do know. If I were you, I don't think that I would do that, which is not necessarily helpful for those that are going through their various stages of healing. I I don't think it's not necessarily helpful. I just don't think it necessarily will always resonate immediately. If it is helpful, you may never know that it was helpful and or you may not hear about it being helpful until way later. Because just because you have something reasonable and could be very helpful to say doesn't mean that someone is available to receive it yet. And I just think there's a difference between how you aid someone in their healing and how the person actually heals. You only have responsibility over the part that is yours. So like you said, Wayne has boundaries, which I think is helpful for someone who is assisting through healing. Um, Hey, we going to talk about this a few times. I have said this the first time we talked. I'm willing to say this to you a couple more times. This is the last time I'm going to say that this is what I would not do if I were you. This is my real sound rationale. Do what you must. And there, this is what I'm saying to you. So it's not necessarily a forcing through healing. It's It's definitely standing in your integrity and someone else's healing though i think this is the the person i am and therefore the friend i am this is what i have to offer on the other hand you in your own journey that i trust you in take what you will take right now and do with it what you will and i will make decisions whether i will still be present with you while you go through this And you can make decisions whether you'll still be with me while you go through it as well if there's too much difference in how we feel. I just don't think necessarily the difference, um, I don't think the difference in feeling or thought about how something should go necessitates, necessitates, can't talk, um, separation. Or I think the only reason why you would try to force somebody to go through something is if you're if you need to hurry up and get out the room, but they not going to go through it. And you trying to make sure that you can stick around with them. The only way I can stay here with you is if you get through this the way that I want you 
to do it without me having to make any decisions that I'm going to change my posture here. If you don't got to do that, you don't need to rush nobody through nothing. You can just be you and they can be <laughs> and they can be them. That's that's very true. And I think uh, part of my self-awareness to it all is I don't like putting a lot of time into the same action. So we discussed it. We identified it by nature. I consider myself what I, I describe as a problem solver and uh, see it, hear it, observe it, act on it, execute, push forward. Not good for everybody. Don't yeah. try it. One out of 10, highly not recommend it. But for myself and even our brother Antonio, that's one of the conversations we have and one of the reasons why we click so well. That's how we live. We see it, we observe it, we process it, we action it, we push forward. But that's that's a self-awareness thing. Yeah, and I think a good point from earlier was what we were talking about um, time and not rushing some things. And I think that there's a group of people, and we hit on it a little bit on a, um, on a different topic, who are just really in a rush to get to where they're going, and they're not appreciating the journey. Don't get me wrong. I think we all have goals and aspirations that we want to achieve, and hopefully there's some out there that we haven't achieved yet that we're still pushing towards. And would it be nice to have to be where, you know, you may want to be in the future sooner than you plan. Yeah, absolutely. But I think it's important to enjoy the journey and, and embrace the ups and the downs because what are we in a rush to get there for? Like what, and, and then what happens when you actually get there? Like, I feel like you got to enjoy living life and not just live a great life. And then you die. If that makes any sense, like enjoy the process while it's happening. But um, leads me to a question. Are super aspirational people insecure? I'm going to surrender that one to KP. What do you mean by super aspirational? What does that mean? If you have a lot of gold, if you want to be the best of the best, if you want to dominate your your industry and in, in whatever it is that you do are you insecure are you not comfortable within the person that you are to let your work stand on itself or is it that you have to make sure that you reach the top of everything to validate who you are to other people and maybe even to yourself i think i lost you for a second but can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Oh, I think I lost a huge portion of what you said. But um, I think that it depends. Um, I think a lot of people grew up in households that, that kind of made kids who grew up to be adults feel like they have to do that. That's number one. So there could be some insecurity there. Yes. I think that you have people that don't have anything else going on and you know maybe their career is all they have going on and they just put their all into that so there could be some insecurity there and then you have people who just that's just them you know and i don't necessarily think they're they're insecure i think that they're just used to doing that and now they do i don't think that they're necessarily insecure now i will say that i come across people very often who step on other people's toes to get to those high aspirations and i absolutely think those people are insecure i don't think that it's necessary i think yes your work should speak for itself and i think that people will see you for who you are and what you stand for and how well your work is if you're just authentic. But I think if you are stepping on other people and not showing up your authentic self, then yeah, you might have some insecurity. I probably have a lot more thoughts on this, but I'm gonna just let it sit for a second.
Candace, did you want to crack before I started running my mouth? So for me, Adam, it's it's a character thing, right? It's not. It's no issue with having huge aspirations. There's no issue or no concern with wanting to be the best at your craft, um, the most wealthy. None of those things are issues. I would hope that for most people, they pursue a level of excellence. So I'm good with the aspirational side of it. The only thing that I am concerned about from the insecurity bracket is what drives it. What is it and at what length, how much of your character, how much of you as a person are you willing to sacrifice in order to obtain? How many are you going to step on? How many small businesses are you going to destroy in order to get to your destination? Or is there not enough space in your mind for everyone to eat or for everyone to grow? Is that one of the things that is driving you to be there? Or do you sit on the side of the coin where I just know that what I have and what I'm offering is the best on the market? And I believe that people deserve the best. Therefore, I'm going to push to destroy the competition in order to offer the best for the people. For me, it's about your character and what's driving your intent. Hmm. Because you not think about the easy, the easy, I guess, parallel for me is looking at athletes and, and how they have that chip on their shoulder and how some of the best of the best, we praise them for for having that chip and, and using that chip and, and some real doubt and some fake doubt and turning that into motivation to, to continue to do the things that others won't do to dominate. And then I go... Are you just not secure enough in your abilities and your work ethic that you can go out and be the best of the best because of what you do as opposed to listening to the, instead of using the outside noise as a means to boost your motivation? I think for a lot of, in the athlete run, I think it's about legacy. There's not an athlete that goes into the league with a high level of expectation that I can think of that isn't like the Hall of Fame would be nice. Like, I can't think of any of them that are like, if I get to the Hall of Fame, I'm not going to accept it. There's there's few and far between that come in thinking that way. So for those in the athletic realm, it's, it's about legacy. It's, I want to make sure that people know that I showed up, I worked hard, I gave my best efforts, and I want this name that's on the back of my jersey to go in history as a person that did better than anyone else. I don't think it's an insecurity thing. I think it's a matter of this is what I want my legacy to be. Uh, okay, sorry. I was reading some really weird YouTube comments. Um, what stifles your innovation? My innovation or innovation in general? I will. I can go with innovation in general. I am not what people would call a creator. That's not my personality. I'm more of a execution person. Like you present the idea, you present the concept, you came up with everything. Okay, let me get it there. Let me be the engineer to help take it to where you want to take it to. But I'm not a person that is coming up with brilliant ideas. But I think when I put, when I presented this conversation to you, I was looking at the state of the nation and, and I think over our time, we have historically become the most innovative when our existence was at peril. I think you look at the World War One, World War II timeframes, those are the times where we really dug in and started coming up with major concepts in reference to computer engineering and things of that nature that now we, we can't see life without. But back then, those are the times that we really were like, oh, okay, we need something to get us to the next level in order to prevent from falling off of the face of the world. But as far as the innovation piece goes, I think that's that's where my thoughts were with it. I think it's interesting um, where the thought for the conversation came from in you, Wayne, because I, my initial reaction to just seeing the question is, 
I think I want to say that what stifles my innovation is restraint. Um, so typically I prefer to be kind of like free with time, free with space to be able to feel as creative as I can. Um, and I think I come up with a lot of good ideas in open space or face space that just feels free to me. But then on the other hand, usually what, if I'm being honest with myself, has to take place in order for me to press out whatever I have come up with in the way of innovation. It has to be some sort of external force that says, that might feel like restraint. Like it, like a deadline is technically a restraint. The time is now, right? So it's like trying to find, for me, it has felt over the years, like trying to find a balance between accountability, another type of possible restraint for people, and then also freedom in thought and creativity. Um, so yeah, I would agree that our perils in, in this country have usually produced innovation from people um, when we needed to figure out a way through something and we had very few options. Yeah, I would say for me, what stifles my innovation, I would say that I'm 50% creative, 50% execution. So I come to the table with the somewhat creativity, but I need to bounce those ideas off of someone else who's 100% creative in order for me to execute that. Because I don't have all the tools in my toolbox, nor do I necessarily know where to go looking for them. So I, I need someone who is only a creative to be like, yep, do that, do that. That's great. You know, before I actually execute what it is. So what stifles my innovation is when that person that's hundred percent creative is not available. Like if, the, if that tool is not available to me, then I'm just, back off for a while until it is available to me. So do you think that's something that you'll ever be comfortable operating without? Um, I think I'm going to have to get to a point where I'm able to do it on my own. I think that for me, I grew up uh, in kind of like a sheltered atmosphere, you know? So I always had, you know, mom to help me, you know? And then I was released into the world and it's like, oh, I don't think I can do this without someone else, you know? And I, as an adult, I still do that. So I think I'm, it, I'm healing. <laughs> And it takes time because I've been doing it my entire life. So it's just going to take me a while. I, I can totally understand that because I come from a place of, of creativity not really being a thing. It's find something, nine to five, ping, ping, ping. You know what you're getting paid every two weeks. You know where you got to go every day in the very routine. And... I don't know where I fall on this mix of creative and 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 get her done, but I'm way more creative than I am on the other side of thing because I, I, I boundary structure that's that's not that's not me. Um, let's just get I mean we'll get stuff done when we get it done, but yeah, I, I don't like structure. But I think what stifles my innovation the most is comfort. Like if I'm getting if I'm comfortable, whether it's comfortable in what I'm doing, comfortable at home, comfortable in like my friendship groups, comfortable potting. If I get too comfortable doing anything, then my innovation goes to hell. So um, for, for better or for worse, I seek places of discomfort. And it's something I've talked to my therapist about because, you know, we're plugging therapists here, is that I seek places for discomfort um, 
because I I want to be innovative all the time. So I don't ever want to be too comfortable and not be innovative because I found myself in a space of entirely too much comfort and realizing there are things that were important to me that I kind of let go. And it was just because shit, I'm comfortable. And once I, once I found myself in a place of discomfort, I actually got that, that innovative kickback. I got that comfort in being in discomfort again. And, you know, for better or for worse, I like discomfort. I thrive in it. But, um... This has been a very well-rounded conversation. Well, you know, I, I try to, to... appreciate it. I think it's been great. Well, you know, we try to have those types of conversations. You know, we got to hit all the different corners. King of content. Uh, huh? I said king of content. Hey, I do what I can. Oh but, um, you know, one thing that I don't even know if I talked to y'all about or if I put it on the list. If I did, I put it up late. Trauma versus accountability. And I don't necessarily think this is a versus conversation, right? But as I'm going to pitch them, pitch them that way for, for the sake of getting the conversation going. So, Wayne, we had that conversation about the individual who suffered from some trauma ended up like attempting to stab a significant other and how that's being dealt with. And I said, within the context of the world that we live in today, those were two totally separate events, two, two different people involved. And oftentimes we won't use that, that trauma from years ago as a reason to explain why that event happened when that, that culminating event could be tied to the trauma. And so when we look at criminals, and I mean people who are guilty of, you know, violent crimes that are not in retaliation to something, right? You know, aggressive violent crimes, uh, your serial name that, murderer, rapist, thief, whatever, people who, who regularly do things that society deems seems to be improper behavior beyond the scope of violence. Um, how much do we tie the trauma that that person experienced throughout their life to their actions? Like, I think there is a level of trauma that explains why R. Kelly acts the way that he acts in life, right? But it's being approached from an accountability point of view, which is the after. We are gonna, we're going to hold you to the societal standard because you have not met it but we're not looking at what led you to this point and not defending R. Kelly by no means. But how do you get to the point of living that life to where you believe that what you're doing is acceptable without having a lot of trauma that led you to the untreated trauma that led you? Bruh, that's a strong, strong statement. Let me say it this way. With no accountability in reference to your inner circle, the people that are close to you and understand who you are, they're not, if you don't trust their judgment and they don't trust yours, you're not going to look at each other and have that real conversation of, hey, man, you're out of line. If you don't trust that, you're not going to accept that. However, the trauma portion of it, as ignorant as it could be, I don't attribute a lot to trauma. The DSM-5 will disagree with me vehemently, but I don't, I don't attribute a lot to trauma because we have the ability to acknowledge a situation for what it is and make a choice on our next action. <clears throat> Behavior, some would say is learned, some would, some would say is instinctual. But throughout our traditional upbringing in this in this nation specifically, we get a pretty good idea of acceptable and not acceptable behaviors based on those that we're living around. We change our environment. We have a chance to change our behaviors, our perspectives, our vantage points. For the idea of trauma being the reason egregious acts are done, I struggle with that deeply. And I struggle with that because I am a 
own your mess type of person. I did it. It's on me and I'm going to take full responsibility for what I did. But that's and that makes it hard for me to look at another situation and say they have deep rooted issues from their childhood that needs to be addressed. And that's the reason why they're going through what they're going through, because it's never been addressed. I struggle with that. I understand it's valid. I understand it exists. But for me, it's a it's a tough place to be in to say. You saw that child, you asked that child to do those things to you as an adult. And you were okay with it, and your circle was okay with it. I don't blame that on his trauma. I blame that on his decisions. Wayne, is your is your struggle then with the fact that as an adult, the person did not like an R. Kelly did not choose to address his trauma, or or is your I understand that your issue is that he didn't that he made poor decisions, right? Like I understand something happened to you in your childhood. I understand. As an adult, this other thing happened. Maybe your trauma was connected to that. You made a poor decision still. So would you say that in some way your the issue that you take with that person is also in the fact that he didn't decide to deal with the trauma so that he didn't make the later decision. I hope what I'm asking makes sense. Your question does make sense to me. And my response to that is no, that that's not the issue. I don't attribute it to age. Maturity isn't age driven and we consider adulthood an age. I attribute it to you looked at life around you as you saw it and whatever state of mind you were in based on whatever occurred and you opted to go that direction now i mentioned the dsm-5 earlier because there's there's a lot of language in there that'll say no this is the reason why they did that and because of that chemical imbalance that they're that they are experiencing they shut certain parts of their mind off therefore they automatically do that I understand that science that goes into it. I am a you made a choice person, though, and the choice you made was piss poor. And you chose an egregious act based on your piss poor choices. Yeah, it's hard for me to see like the versus accountability thing, because um, I think you're always accountable for your actions, no matter if you experience trauma or not, because you always have a choice between right and wrong. And I understand that the DSM-5 says this person did this because of this, but they also, also had a choice between right and wrong. We always, always, always have a choice between right or wrong. I think our brain has fight and flight in it and we are all able to shut down things because there is some trauma involved in it. And then we commit an act, whether it be good or bad. Um, I think we sometimes uh, um, don't know that we're shutting down stuff in our brain or bringing up things. Uh, and it just happens naturally, but you still have a choice. You have a moment, a split second to be like, I'm not going to do that. And I, so I, I, I struggle with it being a versus. I think that, yeah, you can have trauma, but you still, you have a choice to make. Are, if, are you gonna do that or are you not gonna do it? Because if you can get help from a psycho psychiatrist or a psychotherapist for your issues, that means you can absolutely choose between right and wrong. If they can, if those doctors exist to help us, that means we can overcome whatever it is that we have going on in our brains that make us choose this wrong decision. But when we talk about the decision piece, because I, I don't want to get away from that. I think we all do make decisions, but what are our decisions based from? They're, they're, they're based from our experiences. What do you draw from to make a decision? I, I remember someone once told me that people don't, uh, rise to the moment they fall back to their uh, lowest point of training or their highest point of training, some shit like that or whatever. So you fall back on 
on your experiences that you've been through and what if your decision making process isn't rooted in societal right and wrong is rooted in what it's rooted in what you've lived and unfortunately what you've lived that is presented as life was is presented as right does not align with society and then you find yourself years later making those decisions based off of your experiences that don't align with what's acceptable in society. And it's hard for me to just sit here and say that, oh yeah, he made a choice. Yes, the person made a choice, but what led up to that choice and what do we as a society owe that person post that decision or excuse me, prior to that decision and post that decision. And it, it speaks for me to a bigger conversation, a much bigger conversation and what we're doing as far as our prison system goes, are we punishing people or are we trying to um, rehabilitate people? And I think that it takes a, a look at both the decision, but also the experiences that led to the decision to, to come up with the best answer for addressing these situations. Let's stir the pot, big dog. Two things can be true. You can't be held accountable for your decisions and your decisions can be a matter of trauma. For me, depending on what your act is, if you didn't truly see it as a problem, you wouldn't have kept it private. I can't, I can't attribute it to a trauma related issue. If you hide what you're doing. If you're hiding your egregious behavior, the people that you describe, the rapists, the murderers, those that, the sexual assaulters, they are hiding their behaviors. They are not doing this publicly. Outside of uh, one prolific rapper, there are very few that are putting it in their music and broadcasting it. These are hidden acts. And we hide things when we're ashamed of them, when we don't want to make that act that we're doing a public thing because we know it impacts our bottom power. We know it impacts the way that we live. So we hide it. We hide or we show that shame in scenarios where we feel there's something wrong. If I knew I was in the right, I had no issue going public and having that conversation about the right. But the fact that it's wrong, the fact that that's a child, and I ask that child to pee somewhere and do all these weird things, I knew I was wrong. Now, I look at the prison system, I can't, I can't look at the prison system and expect the prison system to rehabilitate my mind or reform my mind for those deep-rooted issues because the system isn't set up for that. The system is set up for punishment and removal from society. The system isn't set up and designed to re you back into society is designed to punish and remove so i don't attribute it to the prison system well should it be should it be set up that way though if we see crime as a matter of mental health issues we can go there but not all crime is a matter of mental health some crime is because people just decide to do bad things for their own personal joys um, you, you and Adam said something that kind of intertwined that I wanted to talk, touch on for a second. So Adam said, if this is something that you're used to seeing, right. And then you were released into society and you did it again. And then you talked about how you you're hiding it because you know, it's wrong. So question, what if I grew up in a house where I saw someone doing these things all the time that were bad and hiding them. So now as a child, I think it's right to do this and hide it. And so I go out into society as an adult and now I do it and I hide it because I think hiding it is the right thing to do. Not hiding it because I know it's wrong, but hiding it because that's what I was taught to do. Now what? It's a learned behavior and that I understand. And it's very difficult to recover from learned patterns and learned behaviors. I still attribute it to you made a choice 
to hide it. Because as you grow through life, you, regardless of your age, as you progress from a young child forward, you get an idea based on not just what's happening in your house, but in the rest of your circle of acceptable and not acceptable. There are a few scenarios out there where people do not have contact with society. And for those scenarios, I understand and I get it. You don't have contact with anything else. So what you see is your life. For those that do have contact with society and they do have interactions and they do have conversations and they do hear crazy things and they acknowledge them for what they are, I, I, I unfortunately continue to stand firm on you made a choice. And although you have a very traumatic past, with your very traumatic past, you made a choice to take on that egregious behavior. I think actually everything that I've heard discussed so far makes a case that accountability is actually a very useful tool in healing from trauma. Because if we can agree that both of these things can exist, you can have a traumatic experience that makes you think it's okay to do something, but it also cannot be okay to do. And you also similarly can choose to do that thing because of your trauma, but it also could have been wrong. So you should be accountable for it. It may be that the accountability which now has to be outside of yourself um, is the thing that says, oh, I have to do something else. It, it's the thing that makes you say, oh, I have to do something else because I've been able to do this all this time and nothing has, it has not disturbed anything I have going on. But when I'm held accountable by somebody and they say, uh -uh, you can't do that. <laughs> this is the, this is the, response that I have for you and the response is not something that you like, um, then maybe there's something else that you have to consider about the action. Is it really, is this really right? Um, I think um, sometimes, unfortunately, people abuse the concept that I'm speaking of and they kind of wield it um, to be insensitive to speaking with like engaging with people who are healing from trauma. But I also think that other people, and it's actually something that is really personal to me because I'm trying to be better at accountability, um, is there are some other people who hurt <laughs> another's traumatic experience by never exacting accountability and um both of those are not okay i appreciate that insight. thank you yeah man that was that was super dope that was a a good spin and a good place to where i kind of wanted to go to this com with this conversation because i think both exist and there is a line of understanding where you have to understand what someone's went through as it relates to decisions that they make, but that does not necessarily um, strip them from having to be held accountable for those decisions. Because at the end of the day, we're all dealing with something and we've all seen some things. We've all heard some things. We've had some things done to us. And it's about how we respond and react to it. And some will get there faster than others. Good for them. But eventually you have to get over what you've gone through. I don't care what it is. I don't care how bad it is. You have an existence here in life. And for you to maximize your existence, for you to do the things that you may believe that you were sent here to do, you, you, you have to get past those things and become a functional member of this society that we live in. I've got nothing else. Is there anything that y'all want to get to? I just want to add, get over 
I, I don't mean to say this like this because I appreciate everything you just said. So here, I just want to add get over to the list of phrases to cancel. How? Explain it real quick. Um, I think to to tell someone who is healing through something or working through the dynamics of a traumatic situation or whatever, even if it's something egregious, like the example that we've been using with mm -hmm. the children, to get over something is dignity stripping. Um, it is not considerate of the fact that healing is work um, and hard work and it is used as haphazardly as people used to i don't think they do it as much now but as people used to say something like go kill yourself i hated that that ever came up like get over it. what do you mean like what you mean get over it what you want me to do L well, I guess jump, over, jump over my lifetime trauma Jump over. Learn, learn to learn to live with your experiences. And I know, and I know that's not what you meant when you said it, which is why I wanted to try, if I could, to separate them. But I want to add the common use of the term "get over" to the list of things to cancel, because I actually hate it. I I stand in support with you on that statement of removing the idea of "get over it" from trauma-related experiences. It doesn't just carry a level of insensitivity towards the individual person and the actions that they have gone through. It also speaks to the fact that when you when you tell a person to simply get over something, we're not talking about a river. We're not talking about a lake. We're not talking about something you just build a bridge and go away from. We're speaking towards something that is ingrained in a person in the most shocking of ways and it requires us to really put some energy into progression to kind of uproot what it is that has been sown and taken life in the mind of the person so i'm, I'm with you on that one candace for sure it's just and i think all of us is i hope all of us is healing through something but for those of us who are being very intentional about healing through something and have been any time, like you recognize that illustration that Wayne just painted as being very present. Lord send you healing. <laughs> Don't. Well, Chill, we are, we're wrapping it up right now. Um, Glad you could join us for the wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to add? Nah, y'all got it. Uh, Kariki, go ahead and make sure you plug your pages. So come to Rooted Wellness Co. underscore at um, on Instagram. Um, we do a couple of stuff there. We do wellness challenges. We do Bible study on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central. Um, we do uh, Bible in one year and we do private yoga sessions. So whatever you need, all are welcome. How much for the private yoga sessions? $30 for 30 minutes. Or if you would like uh, several sessions, we can discuss a discount. All right. We're going to have to get you back to talk specifically about rooted wellness. Not with all these other people out here giving their opinions on life and stuff because people actually care to hear that. You plugging anything, Wayne? Nope. Follow Bose the Frenchie. <laughs> uh, anything else, Candace? All right, go ahead. Tell us about your podcast one more time. Again? <laughs> just real quick, just, just tell us where to find it at. You know? <laughs> the podcast is called Black and Called. Uh, if you go Black to and Black and Called uh, on Instagram, the link is in the bio. Right now it's on Buzzsprout and on Spotify. Uh, we'll soon be on Apple Podcasts. That's beautiful. Shout out to them. Thank you all so much for, for joining me here today. We kept it under our target time. I'm so proud of you all. Like I said, one bathroom break and didn't even go to the bathroom. You, you talk about growth here. My bladder is growing day by day. 
Um, that, that's more so depending on what's in that cup. Well, fuck and what's me. been in that cup the past week? Well, you know what? I've been drinking water, and y'all can kiss my ass. So, anyways, it, it was great to have y'all. Love y'all so so much, Kariki. Thanks for coming on. Don't be a um a, a ghost, uh, whatever that word I was looking for. Yeah, don't be a ghost. Don't be a stranger. There we go. Don't be a stranger. Big baby, yeah. <laughs>